Well, hello and um, welcome. I'm Mark Chatterway. It's really good to have you with us. Uh, this is the session before lunch, so we're going to try to keep things A, lively, and B, a little bit shorter than planned. So the idea is we'll give you a little bit more time for lunch and we won't make you go to sleep in the pre-prandial session before lunch. That's the idea. So what we're going to do is have a discussion between uh, the, the, five, the, the four panelists and me here. We also are very keen that people watching on YouTube and people in the room here uh, contribute their thoughts or their questions. So I have my phones here. And in a minute, we'll put my uh, Twitter and Telegram handles up. I've, I've been told I'll regret this because <laughs> I'm going to get spammed for life. Uh, but uh, just if you've got a thought or a comment or a question at any point during the meeting, I'll try to keep an eye on it, on Telegram or X, as we must now call it, uh, send me a direct message or mention me in a, a tweet, uh, whatever we're supposed to call a tweet these days. Uh, mention me in a tweet and I'll do my best to introduce it. Uh, and if you're, if you're watching and, and you're very comfortable listening in English, but you'd rather write in French or in Portuguese, uh, je vais essayer de le traduire. Et, 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 <laughs> et, en principe, je consigo traduire. So send, uh, send something in French or Portuguese if you want and I'll, I'll introduce it, which, which gives us three of the four working languages of the OAU, right? Sadly, I can't do Arabic, so. Um, so with that, I'm going to get my panelists to introduce themselves because they're so accomplished, I don't think I can do justice without five minutes of introduction, so I'll, I'll let them self-edit. Just to give you a little background on me, uh, I was a journalist in New York, despite my amazingly youthful looks in the 1980s. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I ended up being the first communications director of the gay men's health crisis in New York in 1983. And I've been involved in HIV ever since. So I've worked with um, uh, AIDS United and I've worked with Engender Health and I'm currently involved with Amplify Change and I work as a, a, a communications and policy consultant. So, so that's my background. Um, Mamadi, why don't we start with you? Thank you and welcome everyone. My name is Mamadi Yola, and I am a deputy coordinator at the U.S. Department of State. And at that department, a part of a new bureau that was just recently launched for global health security and diplomacy that is the new home for the PEPFAR program. And I serve as uh, the, so I'm currently a deputy coordinator who is acting um, and covering our multilateral portfolio and our health diplomacy portfolio, and very pleased to be here with my colleagues. Great, thank you, Mamadi. Uh, Christine. Yeah, good morning, good morning, everybody. Christine Stecheling, I'm the deputy executive director at UNAIDS. On, I look after policy advocacy and knowledge. I also serve as an assistant secretary general um, in the UN. And um, maybe most importantly for this discussion, I have been working on HIV in civil society for 25 years, and a lot of it, um, more than 10 years, and we were just talking about with Mark um, in Botswana. So I have a lot of um, experience at country level, what it looks like when you're trying to implement all the wonderful things we think up at the global level. <laughs> Um, and and, and you, you, I think, left out in the middle there your, your stage um, at the Alliance at, at... Also at the Treatment Preparedness Coalition and at the International HIV AIDS Alliance, and I see some colleagues in the, in the room, uh, which I rebranded as Frontline AIDS. Um, one of my legacies, I think, maybe some people find that a bit doubtful, but the biggest civil society partnership on HIV. Great. So Florence... Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Florence Riako Anam. I work for the, I am one of the two co-executive directors at the Global Network of People Living with HIV, GNP+. Um, the Global Network of People Living with HIV is led and has people living with HIV coming together to ensure that we are meaningfully involved and engaged in everything that matters to our lives. So from policy, from programming, from resource organizing to working at the community level with you all to ensure that people living with HIV access treatment, 
people affected by HIV access prevention, and we all have quality of life. Mm. I've been in the field for many years as well. I started right from the community and have grown in different sectors, worked in private sector, worked in humanitarian settings, um, engaged with many of the people I also see in the room in different aspects as a civil society member, but also um, representing people living with HIV in different um, aspects of the sector, trying to ensure that policies and programs are responsive to our needs. And, and to give you a flavor of how the world is going, Florence and I both live in villages. I live in an Irish village and she lives in a Kenyan village. So we were having a Zoom call, her connection was faultless and mine kept dropping out. So th this is really a metaphor for what the next 20 years will look like. Janet. Uh, good morning everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Janet Dorling, I work at Gilead Sciences. And um, Gilead is obviously a company who has been involved in virology in the HIV uh, space for many, many years. I joined the company about four years ago, and I'm the senior vice president of our intercontinental region and our global patient solutions group, um, which covers a lot of the world um, and many, many people who uh, are in need of all of the work that we do across the stage. And, and Janet, you, you made a conscious decision to move out of oncology and into HIV because of the challenges and because of the way we've set the agenda, right? Absolutely. One of the reasons I joined Gilead was because I was so interested in being a part of, of what they do. Now, Gilead is also expanding into oncology, so not to say that I'm no longer interested in oncology, but um, the work that, that Gilead has done is, is very inspiring, and I couldn't be uh, happier than to be a part of it. But, but actually, Fl Florence, I think we often forget that the way people affected have become involved in HIV has become the new norm for life-threatening diseases. So the transformation we've wrought, we often forget how fundamental it was. Yeah. I agree because I think the HIV movement has, has it existed for 40 years and I don't think there is any movement that has brought together everyone in a multi-sectoral way, right? From community to researchers to you know, with the leadership of UNAIDS brought everyone together to a point that there is some collaborative way of action to, to collectively set targets and work towards achieving those targets. And there's a lot to learn from as we think broadly around, you know, future pandemics and addressing global health issues. Yeah. yeah. And, and so that's, that's the great thing about this panel. So we have government, we have international organizations, we have community-based people-affected groups, we have the private sector all together and all looking at, at the issues. So what we want to run through in this session uh, is we want to look, first of all, at the goal that UNAIDS has set for us of ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. And then we want to look at some of the ways of getting to that goal. So we want to look at what partnerships might look like in the future. Don't go to sleep. We're not going to just say the normal stuff about partnerships are good. We're really going to tackle some of the, the tough questions. And then we're going to look at innovation, what, what kind of scientific uh, and other innovation is needed. Uh, we're going to look at equity. Uh, we're going to look at some uncomfortable realities, uh, at Mamadi's insistence, I should add. And, uh, and then we're going to end up by, by trying to bring it back together and say, so how do we unite all of these to reach the global goal of ending AIDS as a public health threat in about seven years' time. Um, so that's, that's what we're going to go through. You are very welcome. Please do send me questions and comments. I've had a, a couple of connection requests, but no Russian bots yet. So, so, so do, do send it to me. So let's start with this, this goal of, of HIV, ending HIV as a public health threat. Um, Christine, you and I to set the goal. What do we mean? Do, do we mean that in 2031 we can all say AIDS is history, let's write the book, <laughs> do university degrees, but we don't have to worry about it anymore? Yeah, we don't mean that. And I think we, there's a lot of interest at the moment to really define what we mean by that goal, right? Um, I think when we set it up... Um, I, can't I think it was 2017 or 2014, I can't remember when we first started using that language. 
I think there was a slightly different conversation, but obviously we have been using it um, ever since, and it's one of the SDG three targets, and it's the goal that we are all working towards. But what we mean by it, and what we are redefining a little bit um, currently, is there will be not a point where we say, um, now all is over, let's move on and do something else. What we're saying is we are ending, and, and I think that's important that we use the words ending AIDS as a public health threat. So we get to a point where we have more and more people living with HIV because less people will hopefully be dying, and that's one of our big targets, less people dying of AIDS-related diseases. And the infection rates go down to a point where we no longer um, appreciate, or we no longer articulate it as a, a threat to public health. But I think the more useful way of thinking about it, and we have started doing quite a bit of work amongst all ourselves, many of uh, the people who are sitting in the room, is to think, how do we are moving from an emergency response, which you know is so closely linked to this this um, definition of public health threat to sustaining an HIV response. Obviously, for years to come, we will have 40 plus million people living with HIV. And how do we think about um, how do our response has to change to support living, people living with HIV? I think part of that is also going to be that we have to keep on asking ourselves how do we stay vigilant? A, that we don't have new outbreaks, and how do we ensure that we monitor this and we, we are vigilant enough to sp step into spaces where we have new epidemic outbreaks? And B, how do we ensure that those who are most marginalized in communities and most likely to continue being infected and continue being um, more affected by mortality, how do we ensure safeguards for, for people? So yes, the goal is ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. And I think it's actually um, an exciting conversation about what will it look like after 2030. But a, we do need to reach our goals to start with. And at the moment, we are possibly reaching them. Um, and then having a, a, a more, um, yeah, a, a different type of conversation about what would it look like after 2030. So Mamadi, your, your job with health security is to make assessments of what's possible, what's likely, what's impossible. How realistic does this seem to you? So where I want to start before I answer your question and definitely concur with so much Christina said is um, to first remember the 25 million people whose lives have been saved because of this work, right? The courage they take to live every day and obviously the people who have been lost um, to HIV AIDS, and that they are the reason why we are all here and continue to do this work. And I think it's always important to start with them um, because, well, first of all, we are all one. I feel like um, definitely uh, at one with the, with the communities that we are serving. But I think it's important to remember that this is about the people, it's about the communities, uh, while we um, sit here and all pontificate for a minute or two. I also want to say that while I'm sitting here, I am representing a program and the many, many people um, across many countries who have um, had the privilege of being a part of the PEPFAR program. Just to be specific, I think ending AIDS by 2030 as a public health threat means that our goals that UNAIDS has set for us of 95, 95, 95 are achieved in every country, every population, every region. That remains our focus, right, in terms of getting viral suppression down and ensuring that HIV circulating amongst populations has been significantly impacted. We still don't have a vaccine or a cure. And to be honest, the challenge of having to live your lives every day on medicine is not the easiest challenge at all. And I think that acknowledging what it takes to actually keep a pathogen under control um, without, without uh, uh, um, with treatment, but um, how much better it would be if we actually had a vaccine. We also, Christine talked about this, have to 
uh, contain the threats and inequities um, that exist because we get to 2030 and we hope that it's no longer a public health threat because we've done what science has offered us, but the humans continue to put up barriers um, to accessing care for the populations that we serve. And then lastly, um, as a global community, we have to address NCDs in the populations that have been saved um, from HIV treatment, so. Be be because, because hallelujah, people are living longer exactly. and they're living long enough to develop the things we old people develop, like hypertension and hypercholesterolemia, and yep. yeah, all of and, and yep. cancers, and whatever. So I, I was I was really struck. By the way, um, Ismael Mato says something, uh, uh, Florence, that that I think you might want to pick up on. I'm going to ask you about what you see as the major roadblocks to this this great vision. What you see as as the kind of things that might stop us getting there. But Ismail says there's a shrinking civil space around HIV. And I, and I think a lot of people see that, do you? Absolutely, and, and I think um, I just want to, to, to say thank you to Mama D for starting us off with why it matters. It's, it's people like me and the people I represent and the people we've lost, that's why we are here. And we have gotten a lot of gains with the work we've invested in. That's why I can sit here. Um, looking like this, and there's many of my colleagues in the room, and just to appreciate that that's not how the face of a person looking, living with HIV looked like mm -hmm. a couple, two decades ago or before. And, and the quality of our engagement, even with advocacy, with working with you and collaborating was different. And all of this comes from the investments that we have made and the civic space that has existed, allowing us to be able to engage, mobilize, come together and speak on matters that affect us. Um, but that informs science and inform um, biomedical progress, um, etc. But these are the things that we see are facing high levels of of threats right now because it's it's not safe to speak about our human rights. We, we are literally under attack. Our being, our existence, our coming together is literally under attack right now. And I, I speak from um, our experience also working on um, primarily sexual and reproductive health and rights program for key populations advocacy in Africa, where it's been difficult for some regions to work the whole of this year because all we've been doing is doing emergency response mm. um, and not doing the mobilizing and the coming together to address the fundamental issues around policy and legal reform that we would wish to do. Um, so people, the laws are, are constantly shrinking our ability to, to come together. There is um, an anti-rights movement that we have to contend with sometimes not well equipped to do that um, at different levels that will continue to affect um, how we work and that's the experience for which we must exist in at the moment. Yeah. And, and Andreas Wolf just said something we'll come on to later, which a case in point, the new laws in Uganda and some of the proposals. We, we will come on to that, Andreas, later on. Um, while we're talking about this, this, this goal, and then I want to move on to how we get to meet it, uh, Christine, what kind of financial architecture has to be in place? Do we have enough money to make well, this happen? <laughs> the answer is always no. <laughs> <laughs> but I think let me start from a different point. You know, a lot of the work that we are doing at UNAIDS and that a lot of countries are doing themselves is that we want to get to a point that countries pay for their own AIDS response, right? Countries need to take responsibility for their citizens or the residents in their and their communities. So the ultimate goal is that we get to a point where every country is able to pay for their own AIDS response and um, that that AIDS response is human rights based, is person centered, is all these things that we have worked for so hard. And let's remind ourselves that before we got to, before we hit COVID, many, many countries were actually on that path. And um, I think overall we saw that about between 60 and 70 percent of AIDS programs were paid by domestic resources before COVID. We often think about PEPFAR and the Global Fund and bilateral contributions, and that's all very important. But we have a growing number of countries where, they're actu where countries are actually able to do this themselves. 
And then we hit what we all know is a severe debt crisis right now. And so the fiscal space for countries to do that is shrinking. So it is not about just thinking about new resources to be put on the table by generous governments such as the United States or um, other governments that are contributing and, and, and private funders that are contributing to the global fund. I think what we really need to think is what does a new financial architecture looks like that allows countries to do this themselves, because that's what it is all about. Um, and we're doing quite a bit of work as, as uh, UNAIDS, but together with the Global Fund and with PEPFAR to think that through. I think my, our biggest worry from a UNAIDS point of view at the moment is that we're, we are struggling to ensure that aid stays on the, the global political agenda and in, it stays on the agenda for continued financing. I think the, we, have, we, have, we have said it many times in the past, we're almost victims of our own success. People believe, and especially citizens in countries where the money comes from, think that AIDS is over, it's not really an emergency, and it isn't, right? And I think the worst thing we could do right now is to um, lower that support and really undermine our gains. And, you know, there's, there's a human argument to it, and it's, uh, you know, I, I appreciate Mamadi starting off. This is all about people. But at the end of the day, we also know there's an economic argument for it. If we're negating now, it will come back to us. And we have seen that in countries where we have lowered our support prematurely, epidemics have risen again. And the, the cost that that creates economically and human cost is, is not a good, it's not a good way of doing things, let's put it that way. I, I mean, Florence's point was such a strong one, right? That, that um, uh, when 25 years ago, we looked at the face of people with HIV and AIDS, we could see at, a, at an instinctive level the problem. Now we look at all of our friends with HIV and AIDS, and we, I mean, again, at an instinctive level, we know it's not true. We say, well, they look fine. It's great. They look but it is true. <laughs> In some way, they're fine. Uh, could I respond to that? <laughs> Please. <laughs> I think there is how we look at people living with HIV, and they look fine. But I think we are all in different forms still arrested 25 years ago, and that's why stigma and discrimination continues yeah. to persist. Mm -hmm. We still look at people living with HIV as risk. We still fear. We still um, lock out opportunities. But also there's a whole component of what was messaged to us or continues to be messaged to us when we access services that continues to also impact on our own self and internalize stigma and how then we, 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 we exist in the society. And so, I mean, we have data, people come up with a report, but Human Aids always shares the report from our people living with HIV stigma index, and you're able to see how it inherently still affects. It may not be that you don't want to share my cup, but you will still not allow me somewhere, um, and it's coming out of of that fear, and it's just probably transitioned into a little bit more institutionalized and also internalized and still affects how we come for treatment, we are there to treatment, um, and we can ultimately contribute to achieving the goals we all want to achieve. So, to achieve those goals, let's think, Christine, one of the things we need is new partnerships, right? If we accept that we can no longer, rel we can no longer be as reliant and international donors, we need clever new partnerships to make resources go further. Is that, is that a...? Yeah. I think we need to think about different partnerships. One is um, with people who are really thinking about new, new ways of resourcing, and I think there are some interesting and exciting ideas around the global public investment, you know, thinking about changing how we are distributing resources, not as a donor-recipient uh, relationship, but funding, uh, you know, global public goods. And I think that's an exciting conversation that um, we are very interested, to, uh, we are part of and we're interested in. Um, yes, there is, you know, there's a lot of um, investment or interest in finding new partners in, in, in private um, in private partnerships, public-private partnerships, and I think there is a lot more we could do, and we, we are starting to do. Um, 
And then, you know, I feel like it depends a little bit. So there is a, an answer to that question at global level, and then there's an answer at country level, right? There are many countries now where you have a really different, um, you know, the one that I know best of, Botswana, I can see that A, you know, you have a country where almost the entire ARV program is paid for by the government of Botswana. Um, where we're struggling is to find money for prevention, and prevention remains a challenge um, in a country like Botswana. So that might be the private sector. Who do you do you work with? And they are they are, they are trying those uh, new new avenues. Um, and then I also think what we need to go back to is to the fact that we are and, and Florence started with that. We are a multi-sectoral response, but we have really been stuck in very linear kind of siloed thinking, right? So a lot of the work we do, you don't tick a health box in a health budget with, right? So it's human rights work, it's gender work. And those last miles or these last percentages that we need to reach is about that work. It is about addressing the structural drivers. So then it's about where are those partners to mm. talk about gender equality, to work on human rights? Um, you know. but, but, and it may be that different partners can do different things, because I saw Janet nodding as you were saying, <laughs> we need these new partnerships, we need partnerships around <coughs> prevention and treatment. You've been involved in some of those partnerships, Janet, especially, I know, with PEPFAR, but I think others. What does it look like from the private sector point of view a, a bit daunting, probably, the idea of being part of these multi-sectoral partnerships where we're all trying to do our own strong points. Yeah, I, I don't know that I see it as daunting. I see it as exciting. I think we do have to be creative, and, and we need to continue to evolve. Um, but listen, at Gilead, we do have a pretty bold ambition. We'd like to end the um, epidemic for everyone everywhere. And we know you cannot do that alone. No one can do it alone. Um, it does have to happen through partnerships. So public health organizations, governments, um, private sector, community advocacy, uh, you name it, we, we do have to come together if we want to expand access. And um, we have a long history of partnerships, so it's something that we feel very strongly about. And they're not just about access to medicines, they're about looking at um, barriers, uh, they're looking at healthcare inequities, and we, we love that PEPFAR has Partnerships is a big part of their uh, approach as well, and we've been very proud to partner with them. Um, there's a couple of good examples. One is in adolescent women and young, young girls, which I know we're gonna talk more about, uh, but this is um, one of those places where we see disproportionate impact of HIV. And um, when, when PEPFAR came to us in 2014, it's hard to believe, it was almost a decade ago, um, to talk about being an innovative partner in a program to um, impact this population, we, we couldn't have been more excited to step up. So we really entered in um, supporting in, in prevention, so making sure that we were providing um, resources and support to keep uh, adolescent women and young girls HIV free, but there's also work going on to address other barriers like um, lack of economic opportunities, access to education, um, gender-based violence, and, and what's so great about this program is not that it, it does wonderful things in, as of, a, in an, as of its own, but in addition, it's a, it's a multiplier. So um, yeah. young women and girls coming out of this program are now advocates in their own communities. Um, they're doing the peer-to-peer -peer education that we know is so critical. Um, if we want to make an impact. And then the other one that, we, that we've worked together on is the MenStar Coalition. And this is about uh, making sure that we increase diagnosis and treatment for men um, with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we know that it's a challenge to keep men connected or get men connected to care. So we've um, sponsored a mobile WhatsApp platform, which yeah. allows men to get information and be connected and really looks at how do we engage in care, but not only you know, get people in, but then make sure they're adherent and they're retained. And this is hopefully with, with the idea of keeping virologic, virologic suppression and um, going for them. So it's both our partnerships where we've each brought our pieces to the table, and I think that's the important thing. We all have a different role to play and different, um, different resources and information we can bring, bring to the table when we work together. Um, we can do things that we're really proud of. So, so s someone said on, on Telegram just now, um, AIDS is becoming like other diseases. It's becoming like other chronic diseases. But I think actually, here's an example of how it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, because you don't hear about this sort of partnership in most 
I can't think of any disease areas where you hear about this sort of partnership, a private sector company doing its skills. I mean, you're, you're not, Janet, going to villages and advocating for human rights. You're bringing science skills, but you're supporting a coalition where, where Florence's colleagues are, uh, are doing exactly that. How does it look from your side, Marmadine? I mean, you're the other, yeah. the other major part of this partnership. So, a couple of thoughts. The, you asked earlier about keeping um, HIV on the political agenda, and I think that part of this effort is always remembering where we came from. When, we, when these programs were set up, the expectation that science was going to save the day once you know, you stopped the dying that was happening, and we still need science to save the day, but we have come together in these unique ways to try and address the needs um, that, our, that our populations have. We've done, as, as uh, Janet said, we've done some amazing things in the past, MenStar, our Dreams Partnership, our Go Further Partnership. And your dream, just for people who don't know, your Dreams Partnership is focused on Young women. Adolescent girls and young women, yes, who bear the brunt of this epidemic, pandemic, uh, um, on the African continent in particular. Um, but, uh, but the point that I wanted to say, I was also going to mention Go Further, which is another um, transformative partnership, honestly, bringing uh, services to HIV, c cervical cancer uh, screening services and, and treatment where it's possible um, to women who are six times more likely to get HIV positive women who are six times more likely to get um, cervical cancer. But I think that, I think that so, so there are two things I wanna say, I think, about um, the partnership agenda because we didn't know that we would be here 20 years later trying to uh, treat HIV in every way possible including addressing structural barriers, including ensuring there was the necessary education. And our private sector partners have been the ones who have helped us with things like consumer marketing and segmentation, experience design, things that we don't know how to do. And um, where my, my boss, John Nkengasong, talks about transformative partnerships, actually making um, partnerships between you know, Africa development banks and other, other players that have not been in the mix uh, um, as a way to go forward and, um, and, uh, and leverage uh, pub the public-private partnership opportunity. But on the other spectrum of partnerships are the partnerships with the communities. And I think that we need to talk about that a lot. Um, Lois Chingandu has really influenced my thinking about the... Um, when we have scientific innovations, that it is the community that helps the people actually adopt those practices and change behavior when you need to or know what is accessible to them. So there is a wealth of um, partnership experience, including, of course, uh, with, with uh, partners like Gilead that we have done some tremendous work with and are part of the future in terms of the large-scale provision of PrEP that we have to offer to our, our adolescent girls and young women. So I think we've answered Mike Podmore's question. I hope we have, because he said, <laughs> can we give uh, a, a, a perspective of the critical role civil society and communities have played in the success of the HIV movement? I, I think you've done... Do you want to add something to yeah, that? Yeah, I think the other thing that we haven't talked about and um, that is really important and makes this response different from other health responses is the infrastructure that we have grown in civil society over the years to hold us accountable, uh, us collectively who are sitting here, but also holding the national governments accountable and holding donors accountable. And I think that is quite unusual. I don't think we have another health program where we have literally built an infrastructure around it. And I think this is one of the big priorities for UNAIDS is to say, how do we ensure as we're going towards 2030 and beyond and as we're thinking about the next pandemic while we're, um, while we're addressing this one is, what does that infrastructure look like in the future? And what is the, set or not, you know, ensuring that we safeguard the fundamental um, 
uh, role that civil society plays to hold us accountable. And lots of it is, you know, we now call community lab monitoring. Many of us were involved with it a long time before it was called that, right? Um, including um, creating observatories across Africa to hold the Global Fund uh, accountable in, in places where we saw that Global Fund implementation was, was difficult. So that is an, a fundamental um, piece. And, you know, one of the things that as um, Florence was talking about the, the, the shrinking space for civil society in the shrinking human rights space, you know, there is a place in the UN where you have civil society on the board, and there's only one place, and that's the UNAIDS board, and GM People has sits on that board. Mm -hmm. Again, it's something we need to safeguard, and we need to find ways of carrying this into the future. So, so Florence, when you pick that up, uh, Samantha Rick says what, I think you've answered a bit of it, Christine, but. Lawrence, you might want to sort of work this into what you're saying. What are other health areas missing from the lessons of the HIV movement? So I think, Christine, you, you actually telepathically answered part of that question. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I just want to pick up from Chris's, and, and thanks for saying that, the infrastructure is really important, and it's, I think it's the most organized civil society-wise um, of a disease that we can think of. And I, I think why my colleagues are asking this question is to just acknowledge that this infrastructure can be useful for governments, for partners, as we think broadly about strengthening um, our health systems to be more resilient now more than ever, as we have conversations around uh, pandemic preparedness and response, as we have conversations around broader UHC, Chrissy talked about how the bigger picture is that our governments are able to address the, the HIV response at national level. How will that look like and what space exists? I think the infrastructure is the system that has existed and created these spaces, so there's the representation in the board. It's how, over years, that I've engaged in the PEPFA COP, the annual planning meetings that happen at country level, mostly at country level, um, and, and, and how that space has expanded, bringing in more voices, mm -hmm. trying to coordinate mechanisms. We cannot hold you accountable to something we haven't planned together. So where does the conversation begin? How do we come together to set these targets together, to set the plans together, and then what mechanisms exist to, to, to further this, and I think these are deliberate efforts by these partners, by say UNITAID to have the community delegation um, within their board, right? And Global Fund to have the community delegation which transcends down to you know, the, the coordinating mechanisms at country level. But what we don't see is what that means for us as community and civil society. Many of us did not even complete school. I mean, so many of us have been plagued by the inequalities that exist because we are people living with HIV, because we represent, you know, the non-conforming, you know, people from the key populations. But we are having to learn to get into the language and get it with you guys and, and be, you know, political or technical or all these things. And there's this whole people power that exists now that I think, as Chrissy says, must be safeguarded, but also we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can use what's there to build healthier, resilient health systems. I, I want to move on to innovation, but before I do, <laughs> we've had a couple of messages from the Ecumenical Network and others, and I'm, I'm conscious we haven't mentioned the faith-based organizations. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another area in which potentially we've set Florence, are you looking, are you looking skeptical or are you looking... No, I'm looking at Chrissy. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going to mention it, actually. Yeah. I think where we are, and, you know, we have, we have some programs, including the faith-based initiative with PEPFAR that um, UNAIDS is very involved in. But I think, and we have had on and off conversations about this, where we are missing a trick is right now, in this moment, where we see such pushback against human rights, against gender equality, and so forth, there is a whole lot of the faith-based community who are our allies, and Absolutely. I think we are missing a trick, and I was supposed to say that when we talked about partnership, but <laughs> oh God. and I think we need to think more creatively and innovatively, and I, you know, often when we speak to the faith-based communities, they, you know, they feel that we are, when we are, when we are um, talking about the pushback on human rights, that we are 
we're talking about all of them in one go and say right. all faith-based communities are doing X. They're not. There's many, many, many allies um, in the faith-based communities. And they're very integral in our communities, right? They have been part of anti-colonial movements. They've mm. been part, mm. part of human rights movements. And we need to just, uh, t uh, tap back into that energy and, and really become more strategic in our allyship as we're having to really think collectively how we are pushing back against the pushback. Uh, absolutely, and, and Christian Connections in International Health, I know, has been a, uh, a real ally which brings together many of the Christian Health Associations. So we, I didn't want to forget that, and thank you <laughs> to the, the couple of people who've, who've reached out on that. So innovation. That, we, we've talked about partnerships. We've talked about some of the exciting things happening there. What do we need in innovation? Janet, I, I'm going to start with you because you're working for an R&D-based company. What's the next phase of innovation that, that can really help us towards the goal? Yeah, I mean, we know that scientific innovation is definitely part of this. So that's something that um, we think is essential uh, to improve um, HIV care and the quality of, of life with people living with HIV. Um, but we know it's much more than that, right? So we need to be innovating much more broadly um, to find new ways to provide access, to address barriers um, and, and inequities to healthcare. Um, but just to get back to Gilead for a moment, I mean, innovation is at the core of what we do. It's in our DNA. We get up every day and approach our work this way. Um, we are very excited to be continuing on in research and development and really focus on person-centered innovation. So this is about bringing uh, diverse offerings to meet the diverse needs of our stakeholders. And we think not only can that really help individuals, but actually will help, help fill some broader gaps that we see in this space. And um, not just R&D, but also how do we do our clinical research? Who do we do it with? How do we operationalize trials? Um, how do we, uh, what populations do we study them in? And I would be remiss if I didn't just say that we're still really invested and working on research and development for a cure because that's our ultimate goal. Now, when we get there, you know, that will be amazing. In the meantime, there's a lot of other work to do, but it is part of our focus. And um, we know that looking ahead as we bring innovation, we are gonna continue to need to partner because the first step is the scientific innovation and then there are so many steps afterwards of how do we get that medicine to patients? How do we get it into communities and actually used um, the way it should be? So we're, we're looking forward, and I know PEPFAR is also looking forward in your strategies to innovation, um, thinking about long-acting HIV injectables uh, for HIV care. We think this can be a real step forward as we think about the future. And um, we'll continue to look for those creative ways to partner. I know we're so excited to talk to many um, around what we can do next, because there is innovation coming, and we think it could be really meaningful and transformational. Question from a journalist, which I'm going to put to one of you on this exactly, I mean, Janet said transformational innovation. One of the transformational innovations, which I think, Mamadi, you mentioned earlier, so maybe you're the unlucky one I, I get <laughs> to put this question to. And Michael Dumiak, who's a science reporter here, says, are resources and attention moving away from vaccine development now, given both the setbacks in the clinical trials and what Janet was talking about, which is the advances that we're seeing in other areas of prevention and, and treatment? Well, I don't want to sound like the experts, because <laughs> I definitely am not, but we definitely remain um, invested in the possibility of an HIV vaccine. I don't think that we can ever walk away from that expectation, particularly after our recent experience with um, mRNA uh, viruses. I think, uh, I don't want to repeat everything that Jana just said, but just to concur uh, with particularly long acting, its potential uh, for adolescent girls and young women, but also wanted to me mention the digital world and how that is changing. Last year I was in Zambia watching um, public health uh, practitioners in Lusaka being able to connect to remote places in the country um, by actually using uh, uh, um, the internet and using those platforms. And really, when, it, when you think about the opportunity to bring um, uh, services in that fashion to people who may not necessarily have had that opportunity or it's really hard to get to them. Uh, there's, there's, a not, there's an 
incredible world waiting for us um, in that space. So over to you, Chair. Very good. I, I, I'm aware that we've got some technologies in late stage development. So biomedical prevention <coughs> uh, technologies, we, we've got uh, long acting uh, prep that used as treatment might be used as prevention. I, I think, Christine, one of it's, it's your phrase, a Swiss cheese approach to prevention. Is that one of your phrases, I think? Where the idea is that you know, the Swiss cheese has got holes in it, but you can't get from one end of the Swiss cheese to the other by going through the holes. So it might be that all of the prevent... <laughs> I think it was your analogy. I think it is somebody in my team because I actually had to write her a note and say, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so the idea, is, I thought it was quite neat. The idea is there are holes, but you can't get from one end of the Swiss cheese to the other because the holes don't link up. So what she was saying... <laughs> is we have lots of prevention techniques. They might not all be 100% effective, but taken together, yeah. mm. they make it impossible for transmission to happen. And I think, you know, when we talk about innovation, the most important thing is, and, and one of the things that has made, irritated me the most in my however 25 years or so long, over those years, every single time we have some innovation, it becomes the one thing that's going to solve the problem. Yeah. So, you know, I remember heated debates about, um, um, uh, what was it called? Uh, everybody getting tested. There was a phrase for it. I've forgotten now. I've tested. talked on two. Huh? No, yeah, it was the test and tree, but before yeah. that, there was call, it, was, it was called something else. And it was like, that was the bulletproof. If we just tested everybody, we were going to do it. Um, then it was treatment as prevention. Now it is... Um, now it is injectable um, carbotegravir. And we know, and, and, and then some of the innovations never get kind of the, 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 the time of day they need, they need. And often they are the ones that are the only ones that have to do with women's health. So even though we are the most affected in, in all of this in many parts of the world, um, they are the least choices for women, right? And so, we all know that we haven't had the, the emphasis and the focus on the vaginal ring that we could have had. And the arguments have always been, it's not 100% and the efficacy. No, yes, that might be, but it's a female control device. It can be used in combination. So the very old fashioned idea, whether we call it cheese, uh, uh, Swiss cheese or not, that we have to layer different prevention methods to make it work and different interventions to make it work. I think we need to keep on talking about that. We need to really push away from um, making one intervention the thing that solves it all. I, I keep on telling the story after the, the beginning of the year, the World Health Assembly, I cannot, I cannot count the number of ministers of health who came to UNAIDS and said, you really need to get us access to carbotegra um, injectable carbotegravir. That's going to do it for us. And then you ask them, so what's your problem? Or increasing female uh, pregnancies in our capital. This is not going to... What you need to think about is how you're addressing the structural drivers that make these young women more susceptible um, to HIV infections, you know, gender-based violence, economic opportunities, mm -hmm. gender equality altogether. So it is really having a more nuanced conversation and using the different interventions that we have to get to our aim. And also to think about innovation, not always just as a technology innovation. There are so many innovations um, that are community-led that come from a very different place, which is about different programming, different interventions, combining different things. And we often don't go there because it is easy, in inverted commas, to talk at a, a biomedical or a technology intervention. And then we do need to talk about the fact that we also need to change somehow how we engage. Um, and, and there is a good opportunity now. Me and Amadi were part of a conversation yesterday about local production. We know there is new opportunities now how we produce um, uh, new innovations and getting, getting production onto the African continent, where we know that at the moment only 1% of medicines um, um, that are being used in Africa are being produced in Africa. So there is new opportunities. And for me, that's also an innovation, right? Local production. So let's talk about that and go that road to see how can that benefit many more of us. So... Florence, we've talked a lot about innovations. I mean, and that's a very interesting... 
important point about programmatic innovation as well as scientific innovation. We've talked a lot about innovation that's kind of within reach. As you look at it from a community point of view, what innovations are in the early stage that might need to come in reach? That might need to? Well, what, what early stage innovation would be most important for you? Things you've heard about that might be a way off but could make the biggest difference? So I, I might res not respond, but just also um, underscore something Chrissy said. I think um, whatever innovations that exist or are in the pipeline need to sort of also look at how they respond to the needs of people living with HIV. So when we are thinking long acting treatment, Treatment fatigue is, 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 and I think I've read papers that show that anybody on long-term treatment, not necessarily ARVs, even people with diabetes or any other thing, do get treatment fatigue. But I think within the HIV sector, it's twisted, and then we are to blame, you the risk, you need to do this. And, you know, so the language makes it something that then we are ashamed of. But when we normalize, but again, this... When I hear long-acting treatment, and we, we talk to each other, we meet in conferences like this, we know who's getting what somehow. I think the divide has always been how in Africa we get it five to ten years later. Mm -hmm. that's, that's been the experience. Um, and for various reasons of this inequality, and maybe just looking at how moving forward, whatever new innovations that come in, and I like something you said, who are we researching with? Mm. You know, like, because... We took 10 years to move from efavirenz to, to DTG. I will be honest about that. Some of us had to threaten to walk away from treatment because of how efavirenz was affecting us. Um, I had to go on baby doses because it was wonking my brains and I was scared I would freeze on stage. And so, but there was many people, young people born and started on this who were talking about different experiences and no one would listen. 10 years in, oh, there's a problem with women, and that's where I come in. So, and then, well, we get past that, and now there's a problem with weight gain, and nobody seems to know where it's coming from, but it's happening to people in Africa. You know? So it's, it's, um, it's all these things. Who are we researching with? How are the innovations being created? How do we access them? At what point? I hear and I'm aspiring that in my lifetime there's a cure. Mm. But I'm scared that we may not get it because it could take another 10 or 15 years before we do if we continue to operate in the systems and in the markets as they exist. So conversations around you know, um, Africa-based innovations as well and, and support mm. for those mean a lot to us because then that means proximity. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then also something that Chrissy said is how we take one thing and we bold it, then we remove everyone else. Mm -hmm. So if cabotegravir is not my thing, then I, I don't need to know about it. So when we talk about PrEP being for key populations, then the rest of the population is removed from it. And it took, I think, um, a few more years before we started listening to PrEP in pregnancies and PrEP in, mm -hmm. in breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. But that was way after PrEP was already available to people. So. I think ultimately women continue to lose out on prevention interventions, especially those in which they can take decisions on. Um, but again, I think it's a whole landscape of how we look at women generally. And we have to remember different things are feasible for different people. Yes. Uh, and so, so the, choice, the choice aspect is important, but also that means there has to be options for which people can pick and choose from what works for them. So, so Jan, I'm going to come to you because uh, I... I, I Christine and then Florence have both talked about this issue of access. I also have a highly technical question here that I don't understand, so Alex Jones <laughs> will come back to you Let's later on, but it's, it's about access. <laughs> we'll, we'll reply to you afterwards. It's, a, I, uh, it's a, the fault of the moderator not understanding the question. Uh, but what do we do, Janet, to ensure access in low and lower middle income countries to, to these new technologies and treatments that, that are both in sight and not yet in sight? Well, I mean, I, I, at, the, at the expense of sounding like a broken record, uh, it, it really comes back to partnerships and collaboration. Um, there is definitely, um, I think, a traditional route that we go, and sometimes it, you know, to your point, slow. It's taking too long to get there. Um, but, but when we really sit down and talk with our partners, I think we can do things differently. And so it's exciting to think about moving forward, not only, you know, how do we get 
to these places faster. And, and I think we could all agree on this stage that the places that weren't getting too late are the ones that have the most need. They have the most number of patients and often the most number of patients that are at risk um, of not getting uh, served with whatever its services or, or the medicines they need. So I think it is, um, it takes a big, a big effort from the community. It takes full commitment. And I, by community, I didn't mean the community in the sense of community advocacy. I meant this community yeah. um, to work together. So partnerships through um, whether it's ones where we're working with PEPFAR or our community and patient advocates and really being in dialogue to really discuss. Because I think when you ask the right questions, um, there's usually a way forward. So uh, I, I'm going to go back to, to the partnerships, and, and I know that we're, we're very, very interested in, in continuing those dialogues, and as we innovate on the science side, to also innovate um, in, on the access side as well. So, so the, the, there's actually a really interesting post. Um, uh, I'm not actually sure who it originated from, but a really interesting post that says this sort of partnership approach is really a model for pandemic response, that, that pandemic response could learn from exactly those Everything parts. about the HIV response is, a, <laughs> is an example. It truly is, and I'm sorry, moderator, for um, interrupting, <laughs> but you asked that question earlier, and I think it's really important, because a lot of times people say, you know, this is a single disease response, all these resources. Mm -hmm. It's so much bigger than that. I think that this HIV response has taught us about how we serve vulnerable people, no matter what is impacting them. And I think that um, if our community can recognize that the HIV platform has become a com community of practice of what it is you're supposed to do, so that you, in a, it isn't viewed as a competitor to all of the other threats that we have to deal with, I think that's a really important thing that can come out of our conversation. And I want to say thank you to Florence for just, you know, educating us all and reminding us all about what it is we really need to focus on. I think we need to talk about women's health. I think we need to really talk about women's health because it is being um, uh, marginalized in ways that are troubling. And um, so thank you. Thank you for your thoughts. Well, well actually, that, that kind of neatly brings us to the next topic, which is this issue of equity and the impact that equity has on our ability to meet the 2030 goal, uh, and, and, and particularly women and girls, right? That, that, that there are multiple inequities that we have to address that make women and girls particularly vulnerable uh, in the face of HIV and AIDS. Um, I think you've outlined what some of those are. Is there anything we've... I, I think, Florence, you made a point to me about the way that we, dis, we talk about AIDS often adds to the vulnerability of women or to, to, to seeing women not as people but as modes of transmission. I will just say what I said. Um, I think... And, and, and this... Something you said excited me because the last two, three visits to my clinic, I was asked if I, I have had a cervical cancer screening. And, and a few of us then started to talk about, oh, our clinics have cervical cancer screening. But I do know that in 2015, 2016, all our advocacy as women living with HIV, because I was at the ICW at the time, was, can you please look at us as people? We are not the people who prevent HIV in children, and the people who help you find men. Because that has been how, ever since I got tested, I have been in the health facility. You know, the questions that we get asked, you know, do you have a partner? Do you, does he know your status? Can we help you tell him? You know, it's, 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 it's this mind thing that frequently then you feel then it's your job. It's your job to disclose. It's, so if it's, it's the women's job to disclose, it's the responsibility we take there for. So then we accept this, you know, the violence that comes with that and the fact that we are not. Um, I mean, in the countries where HIV transmission is available, it's, it's, it, it is happening. It's, it's for women who are breastfeeding because then they're the ones who will be able to feed a child in public and be seen. So all these things have been different. And so for me to go into the facility and now someone asks me a question about me, just that one thing, did you check? 
you know, and for a moment, there's a room here for you to go to, or there de there's a device for you to take home. And, and, and it's, it's, it sounds like nothing, but it's really at that point where we start to feel like we are seen in the health facility. When you have programs like Dreams, when you have programs like Her Voice Fund that are led by young women themselves. So there's just not this story of, you know, doom and... <laughs> needing to, these things that they are doing and they're actually, you know, there's resilience and there's, you know, so I think um, how, how we talk about women and sometimes it's just um, how we do it as well in public health sometimes creates these inequities, whether subconscious or consciously, and that's what I sort of mentioned. We might want to need to change language around how or how we speak about women. Just as I finish, there are great barriers for women because they are women, and we saw that during COVID, and we've seen how this has affected um, pregnancies, particularly about young women. But also, let's not remove all the gains and the benefits of all the empowerment work that has gone into building stronger women, particularly in Africa. And so we need to find a balance where we acknowledge that power. Um, half the time, we don't get interventions because what about the child? You said something about women get it last. It's not because it's women. It's not because we, it's always because all oh, women in Africa don't know how to plan their pregnancies and they may. <laughs> it's, it's sitting in rooms and listening to this thinking and I'm like, which women are you talking about? <laughs> like, because Maxis over there at Y Plus Global, we struggle to, <laughs> to get young women interested in the children's topic. They have the privilege not to be moms until they are ready. So it's shifting how they cannot want to talk about that topic and we have to understand that that's the reality and women like me got pregnant at 17 because there were system gaps at that time and empowerment inadequacies at that time and so I think we need to figure out how to talk to women and understand how we change and shift language about women and how we speak about them in programming. Yeah. I actually want to... <laughs> yeah. I want to I actually want to jump back to something you said a bit earlier because it, it, something you, you said now reminded me of it. You said, oh, often we're told people don't take their medicines, they get medicine fatigue. We actually need to contrast what happens in HIV where we consider 90% acceptable <clears throat> to what happens in hypertension. In Europe, where we don't have an access problem, we, we don't have stigma, we, don't, we have 37% acceptable control of hypertension. Mm. And yet 90% of control of HIV is what we see as acceptable. So when you said earlier we blame people, yes, we do, and we blame them completely wrongly. Anyway, um, <laughs> let me come to you, Janet, because, again, I, I think a bit unusually, Gilead has been really pretty vocal on this issue of health equity gaps for women and girls and done work around it. And that's, that's an un, in some ways a cutting-edge thing, let's say, for a private sector company to do. Well, I mean, I, I, first of all, I just love everything you said, and it, it put so, so humanizes the reason. But, but if we take a step back and we really want to reach our goals um, that, that we say are so important, there's no way we can reach them without addressing um, adolescent women and young girls. It, we just cannot do it. Um, they represent such a big part of the key to success, I would say. And so, um, you know, the way we do it is very important. Um, but this idea that, you know, you think about 4,900 young women a week are contracting HIV. And 4,000 of those are in, uh, you know, sub-Saharan uh, sub Africa. This is, this is incredible. So if you, if, whether you're doing it because it is the right thing to do, uh, but also, we, we need to do it. Uh, this idea that um, there's, so, there's so many people out there waiting. So uh, this is one of the reasons, because we are very committed to achieving these goals, and we're committed to ending the epidemic, and we know we can't do that. And you know, because of that, we've entered into a lot of different, um, like the Dreams Partnership and, and other programs where we're not only looking at, of course, diagnosis and, and prevention um, and treatment, but, but also just what can we do around stigma, what can we do around education, um, because all of these things, we've had a great dialogue on them already, come back to sort of what are these reasons for barriers. So yes, we are 
we are asymmetrically interested um, because it's the right thing to do. And it's, it's certainly uh, the key to achieving what we want to, to do for global health. So, you know, women are, are the key here. And we'll continue to invest here. It's something that's going to continue to be very important to us. I must remember to steal that phrase, asymmetrically interested. It's really good. <laughs> Sorry. No, it, no, it's really good. It, it, it kind of, it says something. I'm not quite, it, it, it's powerful. <laughs> You're not, not sure what it says, but it does say well, something. No, it's powerful. It, it's an image. There's yeah. an image in your mind. Mamadi, just before we leave this, now we come to the uncomfortable realities, which I know you're keen to come to. Let's talk about the slightly less inspirational bit of equity, institutional change, because small and not very exciting institutional changes can make a vast difference to equity, right? If we, if we just change the way we do things. And I think you have a couple of examples of that. So what I want to use the moment to talk about is UNAIDS giving us the 10, 10, 10 goals, right? And for those who may not be familiar with it, the goal is that by 2025, we want less than 10% of countries to have these punitive legal and policy environments that deny or limit access to services. It is growing, not reducing. We want less than 10% of our vulnerable populations to experience stigma and discrimination. It isn't going in the right direction. Same for gender inequality and violence. So quite frankly, um, the conversation isn't, what I want to say is not an example about what it is we're confronting in the country that is making the most, um, getting the most attention, but to say that this is a stumbling block for sustaining this progress that we've made. It actually costs people their lives and it costs us money we don't have. And um, I don't know... Um, what more we can do except try to engage uh, the political leadership and, and make the right kinds of arguments, whether it is economic arguments that is going to help some, uh, whether it is um, the communities themselves, whatever it is, we need to call it out and to say that um, this is the part that we are not proud of, that we haven't changed um, some of these challenges. And they are actually the same challenges that showed up when we had COVID-19 as well. It's the same populations facing the same um, barriers. We've always kind of had this approach that it is about access, that I don't care who you want to love, who you sleep with, what your path into the kingdom of God is. It is just that as human beings, you have a right to these services. And if we can, as a global community, commit to that, Hopefully we can do something about it, but at least put it on the agenda and say, this is part of our shame and we need to change it. So, so, so this might be the point, by the way, where you want to jump into the conversation. So if you have a comment or a question, just, just if you're watching uh, on YouTube, participating on YouTube or in the room, uh, send it to me at Mark, M-A-R-K-C-H-A, on Telegram or on Twitter, and I'll, I'll bring it in. Um, for people who don't know, there may be people who don't know, we, let, let's set out why we're sliding backwards briefly. We've had a, 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 a laws in Uganda on aggravated homosexuality. We've had other legislative initiatives in East Africa increasing the penalties for same-sex relationships, right? We have lots of jurisdictions where people with HIV are still criminalized uh, under many circumstances. Uh, and we've had moves to stigmatize people with HIV in other countries. Have I missed anything on the, yes, to have. bring people up to speed on the challenges? Yeah, no. Can I add something? I think, you know, building on to what Mama D is saying, one of the challenges we have as we're walking towards, um, you know, ending AIDS as a public health threat, to go back to the beginning of our conversation is, when we talk about that, we talk about the biomedical targets and we talk about those goals. And then we find it hard to overlay those with those 10, 10, 10 targets. And um, it's one of the challenges that I find it quite fascinating, even though I know nothing about modeling. As we're doing the modeling, the mathematical modeling, 
I keep on saying to the model is, how do you put these assumptions, the 10, 10, 10 assumptions in your, in your models? And one of the, the things that I want to do better at, at UNAIDS is to really show when we are reaching targets, we are reaching, or when we are reporting on targets and, and progress, we do it to, on both at the same time. And we are building that um, body of evidence to show that to reach 100, 100, 100, which ultimately we will need to get to if we want to get to epidemic control in some way, mm -hmm. it will be those 10, 10, 10 targets that will get you there. And you see that in countries that are doing well now, that have reached our 95, 95, 95 targets, to reach the other 5% is where they will have to get to the really sticky parts, which are about bad laws, criminalizing um, HIV transmission or exposure, criminalizing same-sex uh, sex, criminalizing sex work, you know, we know what those laws are. And I think there is a, there is a real challenge, but also an opportunity to really bring the two together, to say, here is what we all need to do, and that is the path that will bring us to ending AIDS as a public health threat. And I love the way Mamadi put it. I'm going to come to you in just a second, Florence, but because I, I want to get your perspective as an East African. But I love the way Mamadi put it, because I, I can see policymakers responding to that, saying that though if that overlay mm -hmm. has to happen, otherwise it becomes much more expensive and much more resource intensive. Yeah to meet the, the medical and the biomedical goals we're setting. And, and it, yes, there, there, there's an amplifier. And, and we or, need to uh, stop making it like this is one set and it's another set. They belong together. Mm. And we have learned over 25 years why they do. And, you know, when we are responding to a situation, you know, it's not always easy to call out countries if you, if you work for the UN, but if we're seeing countries such as um, the anti-homosexuality uh, bill in, in Uganda, our response as the UN has been, and as PEPFAR, and as the Global Fund, has been, this will undermine your public health approach to HIV. It will undermine your gains that you have made um, on HIV. And so, you know, we have had this language and those concepts for a long time in the HIV response, and we need to keep on reminding people this is not... We are not coming to it, and you know, there's good reason to come at it from a human rights perspective, but from our perspective, it is really from a public health approach. This makes good public health uh, sense, that we ensure that everybody trusts the health system, that everybody feels seen and protected and safe to engage with the public health system, because if we don't, we will, we will undermine what we have already gained. I'm glad someone started that wave of applause, it was definitely. <laughs> so, Florence, the two diplomats can't name countries. They've been pretty powerful, did, but, and you did. <laughs> but you can, you can do better. <laughs> I think um, what, just to go back to something you said, because I don't, they said it perfectly. Um, what have we seen or what have we not mentioned? I think what we haven't mentioned is all the work that has gone into... Um, getting the countries that are also, you know, progressing on creating an enabling legal environment for service delivery and for uptake to happen. And so all the work that we do jointly, again, also very multisectoral with the global partnership to, to eliminate um, stigma and discrimination, HIV stigma and discrimination is one kind of um, multi-sectoral approach that has countries signing in with, I think it was Spain, the, the previous, just a couple of months ago. And so there's, there's always all these movements, but also data that shows where the laws are, are progressive, there is benefit for national health yeah. programs, which we need to, to keep sharing. Um, I think the, the, let me now go back a little bit to what I see as a person living with HIV. A few years back, I counted on the public to feel my pain and to stand up right alongside me. That's not what I see now. There is a global numbness to people's pain going on currently. It doesn't matter for what. We are not moved by people's pain. We question or we try to justify why they must be hurt. They are not like us. Why are these key populations here? But why must they dress like this? You know, like we find reason for why not to be human. And I think... I don't see how we can counter the, the kind of narrative going on unless we try to get back 
in touch with the human side of our work. Amen. Um, and, and my challenge is to, you know, when we were, <laughs> in 2006, everyone had to stand up because there was so much pain and suffering and people living with HIV looked a certain type of way you had to stop anyway. Um, but there's treatment and there's good things that come out of treatment. But now we look like me here. And so there's, there's a forgetfulness. But also let's not forget that there's a whole generation, we have them in my office as well, who don't know what that life looked like. Yeah. They don't know 2003. So we talk about a history they are not aware of. When we say we could regress, they have no idea what we are talking about. And these people are making decisions. Some of them are making decisions already. And we need to find a way to, to, to communicate what's needed now in a humanity way um, so not to be labor on the fact that there are laws, but also the environment for which we exist in is making it difficult. In Kenya, there is no law that could get someone arrested. But my colleagues have been living in atmosphere. A lot of people are getting attacked. Um, religion has been weaponized to you know, come out of church and mosques and take a walk and march and go and attack people. In services, places where people access service delivery for HIV, but just because they are run and led by people who are gay men or um, people who use drugs or, or any other that doesn't conform to what we agree with. So I think it's not really the laws, it's also what misinformation is out there that activates these attacks on people and how that affects our lives. And as Mama D said, we are losing lives and, and that needs to matter to us. So, so Manchari uh, from the International Pharmaceutical Students Federation, asked a question which I think you've largely answered here. We might want to come back to it with some extra thoughts. But one of her questions was, what can students do? And I think you've really said there, it's, it's that, that one reminding people of the interrelationship between human rights and medical success, and two, reminding people of what the past looked like, mm -hmm. which students have a unique ability to do because they can relate to their own generation. Can, uh, can I say something? Mm -hmm. Just off. It's really off. But I learned a lot from, well, in my free time, I like to watch documentaries off of Netflix. There's a documentary called Disclosure on Netflix, and it's, it's trans. It's by trans people, and it talks about the history, and they're there. If you haven't watched it, you should. Yeah. I did learn a lot from watching that. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why don't we have something that shows this history for people to talk about mm -hmm. and to understand from the HIV perspective, there are all these lessons, there are all this incredible infrastructure that exists, and it's not documented. So just throwing it out there now that you're a journalist and all. <laughs> <laughs> no, no and, the, and we have a couple of journalists in the audience, so with any luck, that'll get taken up. Uh, look, I want to come on to our final session. I said we'd finish early and we won't because the discussion's been so good, but we will finish on time. Uh, just quickly before we go on to talking some final thoughts about reaching the, the global goals, um, Rich and Chechi from one of the great uh, faith-based organizations, the Ecumenical uh, Pharmaceutical Network, which is linked to the World Council of Churches, reminds us that we haven't talked about pharmacists as partners in this, and pharmacists really can be key partners. So thank you for the reminder, Richard. Um, let's talk about global goals. We started off saying what the goals were started off agreeing they were achievable if, if we did the right things. Um, and, we, and we've come through this whole session talking about how far we've come and what needs to be done. Janet, what gives you hope that we actually will reach the goal of ending AIDS as a public threat, uh, a health threat in, in 2030, and that we'll have that quality of life for people living with AIDS and people vulnerable? I feel like I should disclose I'm a hopeful person. So uh, that, that, that is sort of my general state of being. But uh, you know, I think it's, a, it's two things that are sort of counterbalancing. One, it's, it's the folks who are on this stage, and not just us, but the very large groups we represent. So every one of us is a single person representing sometimes tens, hundreds of thousands of people who are also committed. And, and I think having this, this community of many people who are coming at the challenges from different directions, that, that sheer numbers gives me hope, but it's balanced by leadership. Mm. Because if you have tens of thousands of people running in different directions, you know, you could all be running exactly away from each other and then you don't move. 
So, so having the leadership that comes from um, UNAIDS and PEPFAR and other places that get us focused so that we know what's important, um, those two counterbalancing pieces give me hope. So the, the hope comes from the fact we have the leadership, we have the purpose. People. Yes. We have yes. That, that shared goal. We may disagree about lots of things, but we're shared in, in wanting to achieve. Yes. What, what then can you, to put you on the spot, what then can you, as a, a representative of both the private sector and of the R&D pharmaceutical uh, industry, what, what do you think your community can do? What's the most important thing you can do to reach that goal? Well, I do think um, we are going to, you know, continue to innovate and make sure that we're, we're, we're really pushing forward on the scientific progress. But I do think the most important thing we can do is show up and understand we are part of a bigger community and a bigger whole. And that our piece is one of many that are critical to work together. It, it's really that simple. So Florence, I think today you've lived a lot of what you can do. You've, <laughs> you've given us the human face. You've allowed us to see things as the community sees them. What do you think people living with HIV and AIDS, and indeed the broader community uh, around those people, what's the most important thing to do before 2030? I know it's difficult to pick one or two. I think use the confidence of the science to shift how we speak about HIV. It will get us to start to address a little bit uh, more targeted the 10, 10, 10. Um, the stigma has to come down. We have to do our best around gender equality and we have to create an enabling legal environment for people to be and exist and be able to come for services. But there is also a shift and that's what I think Mama D and Chrissy started us off on. Um, we are no longer in the emergency response. We are in, we are in a different time, we know that we have made great strides and we can end AIDS. These targets exist to push us, but also because we know they are achievable. Um, for communities, we have no choice. We have to be here. This HIV exists in us. Um, but the ultimate goal for us is to be undetectable for two reasons. If we are undetectable, we get to live healthy quality lives and we are assured to bringing more issues like aging with HIV issues and others at the forefront. But I think also we can then effectively contribute to prevention interventions because the science tells us if people are undetectable, then there is zero risk of new infection. So there is, there is a lot to be done. I am also very hopeful and optimistic and we are in a different landscape now where there's collaboration across all the partners and we are having a lot of community allies, even how people speak uh, in high spaces um, is very warming for, for us. Um, so yeah, I'm hopeful. Another Kenyan, Dr. Mwenda, said to me something else about, said to me, when people see someone from their own village, their own area, who's living a normal life, that gives them the confidence not to deny HIV, not to deny the risk. And so I think you living your life is in many ways. Anyway, thank you, Florence. Christine, multilateral organizations, the WH, the UN system, um, UNAIDS. So I'm like Janet, I'm also a hopeful person, and I think this is what has carried us all through the last 30 years, right? If we had ever not been hopeful, we would have not gotten to where we are. I think for me the biggest challenge, and so what you saw in our last report in July, we were trying to transport some of that hopefulness and says here is a path to end AIDS. Yeah. Here is five countries that are on that path, Botswana, Rwanda, Eswatini, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe, inviting other countries. And there's 16 in the background who are ready to also be in that group. So kind of trying to say to countries, there's a recipe, here it is. If you follow it, you can be on the right path. Right now, we're not on the path to reaching our 2025 goals, but we could be on the path to reaching our 2030 goals if we all went, walked along this path. So that's one, and that gives me hope that we know what to do. We have examples of what to do. 
what we are lacking, I think, across the board is, it, you know, or what we know, it's a financial and a political choice. And I think at the moment we're struggling with that political commitment. We have lost some of that commitment. You see it here, you know, there's very few sessions on HIV. We're not millions of people in this room. Um, we're not the sexy topic of the day. And we're struggling to keep ourselves up there, even though I think we have a lot of arguments. Uh, um, Mamadi made them earlier on to say, responding to HIV is all about responding to the next pandemic, but we are not hearing those arguments loud enough. So let's build on that um, and, and, um, and, and try to get more political commitment from everybody on the in the countries where it matters most, but also in those who can support us better. That's one. The one thing I wanted to get back to before, uh, in closing is something you said, Florence, people are not moved anymore by human suffering. And I feel, I get a sense, we are lacking a sense of global solidarity. And that's what has kept us going. We demanded for that solidarity as communities, as countries who were most affected. But across the board, we are starting to, we see a waning of global solidarity. And that's obviously somewhere where I sit, where we very much depend on global solidarity. And I think it's a collective responsibility for all of us to re-articulate that. Why does it matter? Not for economic reasons, not for um, you know public health reasons, because humanity matters and we are all human beings. We have all been signing up to the Declaration of Human Rights, right? And that states very fully that we all matter and we all have rights. And we, the, one of the rights is to live a full and a fulfilling life. So, Mamadi, I don't want to shortchange you. I have a fear that we don't have a voice of pessimism on this platform. <laughs> uh, but you could, be, you could prove me wrong. Um, what's the one thing that, that national governments who are involved uh, can do? So I have the privilege of saying what I want, and I don't need to <laughs> respond to your question. <laughs> and, um, and what I want to say is that 16 years ago, I landed in Lilongwe, Malawi. It was roads of uh, coffin makers. And um, the privilege of my lifetime is that I've been involved in the country again and can see what happens when there is an investment in resources, there's a country that gets behind trying to make a difference for their people. So I am optimistic because we have been privileged to get resources. This February, I met President Bush for the first time. And there's a photograph in my house. The joy on my face is actually kind of ridiculous how <laughs> joyful I look. Because I was so pleased to tell him, thank you for the resources that came with the program that I've been privileged to serve, the lives that it saved, and the transformations it has made. There is a lot of hope, and what we have to do in this time is, is the world kind of like looks for its next shiny object to actually make sure that the resources we have and the gains we've made, that we sustain those things. So all those people out there who are going to help us get reauthorized this PEPFAR, please stay. <laughs> What a wonderful note to end on. Thank you. Um, thank you to all of the panelists who've just been spectacular. Uh, I don't know about you, but the 90 minutes absolutely flew by for me. Thank you so much also for all of the contributions from you on YouTube and in the room. And uh, I hope you have a good lunch. Thank you. <laughs>